next on PJ Radio's The Unconventionals. You know, look online, right? Look at what technology is enabled and the new models it's birthed. So if you have all these different non-traditional business models, which are successful, Kickstarter, Etsy, you know, in generating revenue and impressions, why the heck are retailers 100 years later still saying sales per square foot? I mean, it's beyond archaic. I'm Mike O'Toole, and you're listening to The Unconventionals. When Amazon can deliver pretty much any product, sometimes on the same day, and probably for less money than you'd find it elsewhere, what is the role of the store? This existential question is being asked by retailers all over the country, and many think of Circuit City or Borders or a thousand other chains that are dead or dying don't have the answer. But there's a remarkable experiment in retail happening at Story, a boutique in New York's Chelsea neighborhood. Story's success is a reminder why retail, when reinvented for how we like to experience brands today, has such a stronghold over us. This week, our guest is Rachel Schechtman, Story's founder. Story's a deliberate mashup of retail, magazine, and gallery. Every six to eight weeks, the store is rebuilt from the ground up around a new narrative. As we move into our third season of The Unconventionals, we're doing something a little different. Before we dive into our conversation, we'll spend a few minutes framing up the prevailing wisdom that our guest is upending. I talked to David Rogers of Columbia Business School. David is director of the Center for Global Brand Leadership, and he speaks and writes extensively on the topic of disruptive business models. So I'm here with David Rogers. Glad How to are be you, back, Mike. Very good. Thanks. Today, we're going to focus on, we're going to dive into the retail market, and I'm talking to Rachel Schechtman at Story, the retailer based in Chelsea. Great business. Very, very innovative model. Uh, it's a lot of fun to talk to her. And so if uh, you're an ambitious person like Rachel, you've got a great idea for a retail model, uh, what What's the path there? What, is, what, do, what do the experts tell you you should look for? Well, the, the traditional path, if you would, for, for building a great retail brand would be uh, you know, primarily three things. One, you want to get scale. Uh, you've, you've got to grow your size so you get visibility in the marketplace to consumers, but also so you can uh, gain some leverage in dealing with uh, the product brands. It's very important to like succeed Walmart. in the business. Exactly. Walmart's you know, at the ultimate end of that. They have uh, great power in the marketplace. But also, if you are a buyer at a, um, you know, a high end of luxury, you're at Barney's or something, you want to be in a position where you can get access to uh, the most exclusive product. So at that end of the market as well. Uh, second thing would be you've really got to create a unique experience. Uh, and really the idea is how do you standardize that? Think of Starbucks, that consistent experience all around the world, or, or McDonald's. Um, the third thing is, of course, you've got to, to make any of this happen. You're going to have to attract investors uh, probably early on. Um, and so you're looking at key metrics like revenue per square foot is a is sort of an important metric within that industry of retail. Rachel and Story, I don't know that they do any of those three things. No. <laughs> they look very different from... Uh, from uh, that, I've really departed from some of that advice. Yeah, that's true, and that's really what makes Story uh, such an interesting business. Uh, really, in a sense, I think she's sort of mashing up a retail model with a, a media model. It's very driven by the idea of narratives, uh, which has become very important in a lot of areas of, uh, of business today. And that hybrid approach... Uh, that very unconventional business model, if you will, is what allows her to really sort of reinvent the economics of what makes a business, a retail space business, uh, sustainable and, and, and vibrant. And she gives her a clout that allows her to reach out to some really impressive uh, partners and brands in a way that a traditional retailer really wouldn't be able to. Rachel's connection to retail goes back three generations, and she has a deep professional background in retail herself. She's consulted with some big brands, JCPenney, The Gap, Kraft, and some notable new brands like Tom Shoes and The Gilt Group. All of this has given her firsthand knowledge of the shortcomings in traditional retail. But she's also had a ringside seat to innovation in the category. And one thing that's excited her is how brands are starting to partner in new ways, like Starbucks showing up in Barnes & Noble. They're totally new kinds of collaboration, which suggested it might be a fertile time for experimenting. We talked to Rachel in Chelsea in the middle of her busy store on the first day of her newest narrative, A Cool Story, launched just in time for summer. You know, one thing I said years ago and the other day I was walking down 
Fifth Avenue and I stopped dead in my tracks with excitement by the Uniqlo store and they had a Starbucks sign on their door. And the reason why I was so excited is because 10 years ago I said, you know, you're going to be going into retail stores and, you know, a Banana Republic could have a coffee shop and another store could have a nail salon and and the reason for going into stores is going to evolve and shift and it's going to vary by brand in the same way merchandise varies by brand. And look at today, right? We have Dwayne Reed drug stores. Ones in Brooklyn have growler bars. Um, Dwayne Reed in the financial district has a sushi bar. Uptown, there's nail salons in the Dwayne Reed. You have Starbucks at Uniqlo on Fifth Avenue. And so I just think that, you know, we all only need so much stuff. The same stuff is available other places. And so you can do one of two things. You can sit there and squawk and, you know, woe is me. Um, We're not generating enough sales. We're being used as showrooming for other brands. Or you could sit there and say, hey, are there other ways we could create customer loyalty and simultaneously generate revenue in a different way? And what drives me crazy is, you know, look online, right? Or look at look at what technology is enabled and the new models it's birthed, right? And you look at Warby Parker or you look at Birchbox creating subscription retailing or Quirky doing crowdsourcing of invention. So if you have all these different non-traditional business models, which are successful, Kickstarter, Etsy, you know, in generating revenue and impressions, why the heck are retailers 100 years later, still saying sales per square foot. I mean, it's beyond archaic. And so... Well, it's hard for brands to get along sometimes, isn't it? I mean, I, I think if you're an established brand, it's yeah. you like to be in control. But you've done a lot th- in that area with stories. So you've gotten big brands to come in and collaborate on stories. And uh, how do you do that? So how do you get a quirky... Maybe quirky's not such a big brand, but you've had GE and you've right. had Benjamin Moore and... How does that work? How do you, as a one-shop retailer, how do you get, how do you call up GE and say, do you want to work together? (laughs) Well, other than my personal passion for cold calling, um, I think, um, you know, I guess the short answer is, um, you know, sometimes it's like dating, right? Sometimes it's a match and sometimes it isn't. And what we're doing is different, right? And I entered into this with the hypothesis that retail is an untapped media channel. And if people are investing in outdoor advertising and TV, in print, and you look at the numbers, not necessarily in our one shop on 10th Avenue and 19th, but you look at a Gap or Abercrombie and Fitch and the amount of people going in those stores on a daily basis, multiply it by a 30-day traditional media cycle, the amount of time and impressions trumps many of those others. And I'm not... I'm not proselytizing that it's either or. I'm just saying it should be in addition to. I mean, success to me is, you know, two years from now, a media planner at a a big media buying company has retail media as a line item. And so, you know, I think the brands, you know, what Beth Comstock at GE has done, I mean, she's always ahead, two steps ahead of everyone else. The agency she chooses to use, how she markets, you know, they were talking about the maker movement and making 3D printing and injection molding accessible to the everyday consumer before it was a thing, so to speak, in the zeitgeist. And and the other thing I would I would say is, you know, again, we think about online impressions driving offline behavior. Um, But why can't you use offline behavior to drive online impressions? So, I mean, an average story gets 50 to 100 million digital impressions ranging from social to earned media. And so you're getting the impressions, you just have a different point of entry. Of course, offline impressions do drive online behavior, which is a big problem for retailers. Showrooming, where you find the product in the physical store and get it cheaper on Amazon or somewhere else online, is an enormous drain on value for physical retailers. Story is trying to shake up that equation. Rachel creates novel experiences, often with global brands, that can't be showroomed. You have to be in-store to be a part of them. And these experiences get a lot of attention. They are new, and they're super engaging. Like You could come in for a shave during the Gillette-sponsored His Story. And they're also perishable, like an art show at a gallery. Now, the brands really value the attention. They're used to paying for impressions through advertising. And they'll also pay for the ability to experiment at the store level. 
Now, Rachel mentioned Beth Comstock and GE. I think getting into the GE story collaboration will help reveal the power of these partnerships. It's one of my favorite stories because of what it ended up producing at the end, which is, um, uh, so what they had sponsored was our Making Things story. So it was a year and a half ago, and it was all about democratizing access to making things. So we had eight MakerBot 3D printers. We had an injection molding machine, a laser cutter, and a CNC mill. And 75% of the store was pure experience. And you could come in and make something. You didn't have to pay. You didn't have to sign up and give your email. You could just make things. And they were very open about it. You know, and their name and logo was on the wall. But at the end of the day, this isn't just about paying to smack your logo on a wall, right? And, and what I mean by that is the deliverable for each corporate partner is also different. And a lot of people don't know that. So a lot of people are like, oh, they're sponsoring a store on 10th Avenue. But Pepsi used us for market research and R&D. Whereas Amex used us as content acquisition for Small Business Saturday. And GE was about democratizing this conversation around making things. And that's a perfect example of what I was talking about back to the, to the comparison with traditional retail, is we weren't sitting there saying, how are we going to monetize it? It was really as it relates to sales per square foot. So we stopped and we thought, to tell the best story about making things, it should be about experience per square foot. Because what's the point of making things if you can't make them? And, and then you just account for that revenue in different ways. But the other thing is they're not just a logo on the wall because they're a subject matter expert. GE knows a hell of a lot more about advanced manufacturing than Rachel Sheckman or Story does. And one of my favorite, favorite, favorite stories is we have a neighbor across the street by the name of Arthur Randall. And I met him um, two months after the GE story. And he came in and he wanted to introduce himself to me and he said, you know, I love what you do. I came in during your making things story and I, I had never seen a 3D printer before. I didn't know what one was. And I'm a graphic designer, but I never thought about my design as three-dimensional. So I played around with the machine a bit and I made a product and I want to show you to see what you think of it and if you think I should do anything with it. So he showed me this product called Scotty. It's a doorstop and a bookend. And I said it was great and that we'd sell it. But you're talking about a gentleman who lives across the street who makes his money as a graphic designer, who now has a company because GE, this Fortune 100 company, created this experience. And so, you know, I'm not saying we have the scale of a Kickstarter. Of course we don't. But what I am saying is these are very meaningful data points. And so if you look at ourselves as a lab where you can get some very fast reads on this new frontier of physical community and experience, I think it's really exciting. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Rachel Schechtman of Story. We'll also check back in with David Rogers to hear his thoughts about what makes Story such an interesting model. You're listening to PJ Radio's The Unconventionals. If you'd like to learn more about the show or join in on the conversation, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash unconventionalsradio. Our academic sponsor for The Unconventionals is the Center on Global Brand Leadership at Columbia Business School, which turns the research of academia's foremost thinkers on branding into practical tools and insight for real-world application. For more information, visit globalbrands.org. Welcome back. We're talking to Rachel Sheckman, founder of Story, the Chelsea store that reinvents itself every six to eight weeks around a new theme, complete with new merchandise, new brand partners, and new in-store experiences. We talked with Rachel about the making things story that she created with GE. Story can be hard to define. Whenever I called it a retailer, Rachel would take exception. She believes the store is as much a magazine as it is a retailer, and it is in the intersection between these models that story becomes really interesting. So you had said during that store, uh, that story, you had maybe seventy percent of the floor was store was experience. So how do you get paid for that? So I, I know revenue per square foot is the is the measure, and this can't be cheap 
<laughs> space right, here, yeah. and you had to make that space work hard. So you're not selling as much stuff, I imagine, if 70% of it is experience. So how, what's your, how do you make so that work from a revenue? we sell sponsorship. Okay. So like advertising. So whether it's GE or Quirky or Pepsi, sponsorship ranges from $75,000 to $300,000. And you're able to get them to do that, even though you're a one-store retailer, and that's about experiences. And but I, yeah, but I mean, I think you can position it that way if you're defining us as a retailer. But yeah. I don't define us as a retailer. Yeah, fair so enough. So part of what we do is retail, but I don't look at the products we sell. You know, in my opinion, you know, that's the content, right? So if you put the book that says unplug every day right next to Quirky's pivot power where you put plugs in, you're going to see that Quirky product come to life in a different way than if it was just on a shelf at Best Buy. Right. So if we were just a retailer, then no one would need to partner with us. They could, Quirky could just sell to Best Buy. But really what it's about is, you know, if you look at the Venn diagram, we're at the intersection of consumer brand and maker. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we're just a dating service using storytelling to connect brands and consumers like GE. Well, so and what's interesting about that is I can't help but think about retail. When I think just retail, power is important, right? Between if, if the retailer is really big like Walmart, you have a lot of power over the maker. If the, if the brand's really big, you can probably write your own ticket right. to the retailer. So who has the power with you guys? Well, I think one of the great things is that you know, we're quite democratic, you know? I mean, we just had a meeting today with American Express, you know, and I sat there for an hour and a half talking about how passionate I am. You know, every year I have my own geeky internal Rachel focus, right? And so first it was retail as media, second is merchandising as advertising, and what I'm really obsessed with right now is democratizing access and discovery in a physical world, right? So if Etsy democratizes access for makers to sell online and Kickstarter democratizes access for people to launch projects and brands online, where's if that resonates with us in a digital form, clearly there's probably a demand and a need and an opportunity for it in a physical form. And so, you know, I was just saying one of my proudest moments was during his story with Procter & Gamble, you had Gillette next to a premier brand like Diptyque, which sells at Barney's, next to a hipster brand from Brooklyn that does denim accessories, next to a hobbyist making stuff in their apartment. And so... And they're all playing nice. They're all playing nice, but here's the thing. They're non-competitive. And at the end of the day, we start with one question, which is a different question than I would, I would say a traditional retailer starts with, and that would probably be um, what fuels this democratic notion that I have in terms of our approach, not just to consumer marketing and brand positioning, but also merchandising. And what that is, is we start with one question. Is it relevant to the story that we're telling? Period. And so if you go in and you say, is it relevant to the story, and you choose to not go after competitive brands, it self-selects a dynamic conversation that's going to get 10x the, you know, when we did his story, uh, Details Magazine, part of Condé Nast, was a sponsor. Birchbox Man was a sponsor. And Procter & Gamble was a sponsor. p and is going to get, you know, at least 5x the impressions because you have Details and Birchbox tweeting about it. If those guys weren't partners, and there's nothing competitive about them, everyone benefits. Right. No, it makes sense, and I, I, it, but it, it is very hard for brands to do that, right? To let go control, and, and maybe I, I was going to ask you, and this is a hard question, but what percentage of you are a retail, what percentage media, but I suppose you're saying it starts with the story, and then you don't worry so much about what's retail and what's media. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, it normally shakes itself out. I mean, I'm not, if I don't have the sponsorship dollars to support it, and we want to dedicate 75% of the floor to the experience, I have to figure out how to do that, right? And so I think there's a myriad of different tactics, some of which we've used, others which you know, we can explore. Um, 
but you know, it varies story to story. I mean, some stories sponsorships more than sales and other stories sales is more than sponsorship. I mean, the truth of the matter is I didn't fund the company. You know, it was self-funded. I didn't raise money. And so, you know, I'd argue we're only running at what 20% of our capacity is just off this one store, just by lack of, of, of bandwidth and body, so to speak. Um, so I would argue if we had the head count that I would fantasize of, um, you know, sponsorship could, would trump retail sales. But that's also not to say, I mean, holiday time, if you forgot sponsorship and you just looked at sales per square foot just for holiday, I mean, we were trending next to Lululemon, which is, you know, top five retailers. So it's nothing to balk at. It just depends on what that story is. We talked with David Rogers at the outset about conventional wisdom in retail. And one of the traditional truths in retail is that scale equals impact. Getting big, opening more stores is where the leverage, the attention, and the money come from. Rachel thinks about scale, but as you'd expect, she defines it differently than most. You've uh, bootstrapped this yourself. You don't have outside funding in. Um, the typical path to retail greatness is you scale, right. right? And is that part of your plan? Like, if you do you want to go out and get funding? And how does a model like this scale? I'm curious. Um, well, it's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, the truth of the matter is there's so many different ways to look at scaling, right? So scaling could be taking the lessons we've learned in our lab called story and spinning off different businesses or adjacent businesses. Scaling could be digital. Scaling could be additional doors. And I think in the same way where I would argue we retail is part of our business model, but it's not entirely our business model. So, you know, to some degree, we're part retailer. To another degree, we're part agency. And to another degree, we're part community center. And those are kind of the three pillars of what we do that are then also analogous to the content and the sponsorship. And so I think when you look at how we're going to scale, it's going to not be just one of those, but it will be all three. So there will be a digital component. There will be more physical impressions, but we don't need 50 doors to scale. And we don't necessarily see that as a success metric in the same way we don't look at sales per square foot. Uh, What about scale for you personally? Like, I I think it was... uh... I mean, in New York Times interview, where you said like your goal is to have a life, and I can imagine, given the way you run the business, I, I don't know how you're probably sleeping six hours a night and spending the rest of the yeah. time here. So well, the is, good news is I have to sleep eight hours or I won't function. So I do sleep eight hours, and I actually do travel and go away. Um, yeah, that got that got me at a tr- at a very hairy time over Christmas. But the the truth of the matter is this: here's the truth. I wasn't your typical, you know, I'm a born and raised entrepreneur, but I wasn't the typical entrepreneur sitting there being like, okay, what's my business plan? What's three to four year growth strategy, right? So like on the one hand, it was a blessing and a curse that I didn't have funding and that my brain doesn't work that way because I just did it, right? No business plan, you know, no financial projections. I literally just did it. And the reason why I did it was I had a theory. I had my Rachel theory that retail could be a viable, compelling media channel for brands and consumers, right? B, you could create a dynamic physical retail brick and mortar experience that wasn't just engaging for consumers and brands, but that was also profitable within one year. And I mention that because not only is profitability not often associated with startups in the first year when you're talking about technology, when you're talking about traditional retailer, you break even in year three, and you're lucky if you're profitable in year three. So did you make it? I wanted to make sure that we were profitable in our first year. And yes, we did make it. So I stood up on stage as one of the keynotes at the National Retail Federation a year, almost to the day, and announced we were profitable. But here's the thing, like back to the question about having a life or your vision, I literally, to be honest, had zero, like that was my goal, to be profitable in a year and do this. And I did it. And here's the truth of the matter is I went an entire year, and this was the part that I think um, is what killed me. And and Kat Cole, who's the president of Cinnabon, you know, talks a lot about your natural state and then the state you're required to be at depending on whatever that experience or challenge is in front of you. And the difference between those states is emotional labor. And so I was working overtime with emotional labor because what I realized 
now in hindsight is I wasn't working towards anything because I had already done it, right? Done it in my version of doing yeah. it, right? And so everyone's talking about scale and growing. And yeah, we grew, we doubled what we did in the first year, but in spite of ourselves, because to your point, at the end of the day, what am I good at? I'm good at creating, not maintaining or growing. And year two was about maintaining and growing. And, and that's where I expended more emotional labor than one could fathom. And so now it's kind of all come full circle where it's like, all right, we're either going to do this or go on to a different theory and experience. Yep. And the answer is we're going to do it. So now it's just having some very high level conversations to figuring out who the best partners to scale with are. There's a lot of invention going on at Story. The focus on narrative, not category. A new way to partner with brands that upends the power dynamic and a new way of looking at value, experience per square foot. I'd like to bring back David Rogers for some final thoughts. As I talk to Rachel, David, I, it occurred to me that there's a lot that's interesting there. It's what's happening in her store at a true retail level, the products she's merchandising, the experience she's created. There's also the stories every six to eight weeks reinventing uh, the narrative. It uh, keeps you coming back as a consumer. It's it does, new an, an entirely new experience. But maybe what's most lasting and most disruptive is the way she's working with some of these big global brands, uh, GE, for instance, uh, or Gillette. And the way that they're creating novel experiences uh, that aren't quite just about shopping and they aren't quite just about media, but they're somewhere in between. And that neither of them could do without the other. Uh, That I find particularly interesting because a lot of big brands right now are looking for this opportunity to co-create Uh, new business models, new sources of value, new experiences. Sometimes it's within consumers and maybe with channel partners. A lot of them, though, are are, are looking like like GE at these new startups with very innovative, different approaches to business, whether it's GE partnering with a Corky. And we saw a lot of those products in the cool story. Exactly. And, you know, whether it's a Silicon Valley startup or somebody uh, like uh, like Rachel in New York uh, in a retail space or media companies, uh, the large brands are realizing they're not going to create all these new sources of value themselves, so they're looking for new ways to partner and co-create it with some of these new business models. And I think that's what upends that traditional power dynamic. You don't have to be an enormous retailer to make yourself interesting to a brand like GE if you can begin to create those experiences. Exactly. And I think businesses are waking up to the fact that we're no longer in a binary world where you're either my partner or you're my competitor. Uh, It's one of the things I'm writing about in my next book is this idea of business ecosystems. And every relationship is inherently sort of a bit of a mix of competition and collaboration. And, And you've got to see that opportunity in every business you're working with. David, thanks for making the trip to Cambridge. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate having you as always. Glad to join you. I'm Mike O'Toole, and this is The Unconventionals. On our next show, The Beginner's Mind. In Japan, we have the phrase shoshin, which means beginner's mind. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind... There are a few. David Rogers and I will talk about how naivete can be more important than expertise if you're a disruptive entrepreneur. The Unconventionals is written and produced by Mike O'Toole and Reed Mangan. Post-production and technical direction by Reed Mangan with Emmanuel Ording and Anthony Gentles. Promotion and social strategy by Greg Straface and Graham Spector with Tori O'Neill. Our creative director is Aaron De Silva. Our executive producer is Phil Johnson for PJA Advertising and Marketing. I'm Jafia Leahy. To hear more episodes of The Unconventionals, visit pjaradio.com. This is PJA Radio.